Okay, so here's the thing. None of us are perfect. We might lay down a factory that we think is perfect, but when we start pushing that factory to its limits, we find out that it isn't. Well, if we are looking for places where that factory isn't perfect, then yes, we might find those imperfections. But what if we aren't looking for them, or just don't know where to even start? This is the video that answers that question. At the most basic level, when we click into an assembly machine or chemical plant or whatever, this is what we want to see. Things being constantly made one after the other. The moment one thing is finished being constructed, then the next one immediately begins. This is the maximum efficiency that this assembly machine can achieve. We want this situation to be occurring as frequently as possible around our factory. Now, there are a lot of processes in a factory that need to be constructed in order for it to achieve the things we want it to achieve, but not all of those processes require maximum efficiency for that factory to succeed. The critical processes, however, the things that the factory needs most, there is a lot to be gained if we can make those processes as efficient as possible. So let's go through all the different ways that we can lose efficiency with our factory setup. The first way is that we aren't delivering enough materials to start with. This is probably the most obvious problem to see. To start with, that conveyor belt will be stripped bare by the inserters in the block, so material probably isn't able to reach the last assembly machines in the line. It is possible that the first assembly machines in the line are working at maximum efficiency, but not the whole block. If we go into one of the problematic assembly machines, then we can see the input materials slowly building up until the correct amount is reached and then a unit is constructed. Then we wait for some more input materials. Then a unit is constructed. The production isn't continuous. It is being held back. This is without doubt the first problem you will encounter with regards efficiency and production. It is literally the very essence of the game itself. The factory must grow. We always want more. And that is the general solution to the problem, to increase the materials more and more and more. Problem solved. Eh, kinda. I will come back to this. The next way that our factory can lose efficiency is in the inserters. We can present the correct quantities of materials to the assembly machines, but if those inserters are not able to input the material quick enough, then they will hold back the whole process. The way to see this on a map is that the input conveyor belt will be completely full of material, but when you open the assembly machine, it won't be operating continuously. The input material that is holding up the process will behave as in the first example, slowly counting up until the correct number is reached for it before a unit can be created. This problem manifests itself in almost exactly the same way, the crucial difference being that the input material is clearly there on the conveyor belt, it just isn't being picked up. And just as an aside, it is incredibly easy to go from problem number one straight to problem number two, in that we can have a problem delivering enough materials, we can then fix that problem, and then we can immediately have a problem inserting those materials which needs a separate fix. These efficiency and productivity losses tend to happen like this in Factorio. We fix one problem and that causes another problem. We fix that problem and that causes another. Ad infinitum. That's what I'm trying to address here. I'm trying to slowly make my way through that chain of errors. The fix for this inserter problem isn't always obvious. If the problematic inserter is a normal yellow one, then we can upgrade it to a fast blue one and happy days. But if the problematic inserter is a red long one, then there isn't an immediate fix because there isn't a fast long inserter, at least not in vanilla. So if the problem is that we have a long red inserter not able to input material fast enough, then I'm afraid if we want to solve the problem once and for all, then we are going to need to demolish that block and rebuild it so that it does not require the red inserters to start with. There is no quick fix to the red inserter problem other than to download a mod. If you want a detailed description of all the ways this can be achieved, designing a block without the red inserter, see my sexy blocks video. So that is the basic input and output of a single block. But what if that block has a hundred or so assembly machines in it? Am I expecting you to individually go through each assembly machine and check whether it is producing things at the maximum rate? Not at all. When we hover our mouse over an individual assembly machine, we get a panel indicating the relevant statistics of that assembly machine. One of the numbers in this summary is the number of items produced. Individually, this number doesn't mean anything. It is really just a representation of how long the unit has been running. But we can use it to compare assembly machines in a block against each other, and we can do so at a glance. 
If we are casually checking this number over multiple assembly machines and we are getting numbers like 1022, 998, 1047, you know, numbers that are relatively close together, and then we hit an assembly machine with number of items produced equals 14 or something, then we know that, that assembly machine has a problem. We can then investigate that individual machine to see what's going wrong. Ultimately, we want all of the assembly machines in a block to be operating at maximum efficiency. So technically speaking, if we have designed the block correctly, we should only need to check a single assembly machine and that will tell us whether the whole block is doing what it should. We then just need to check the items produced for each assembly machine to see if there are individual problems and those two checks should be enough to tell us whether there are problems in the block or not. Let's talk about that input conveyor belt issue that I alluded to earlier. The policy of more equals better isn't always a workable solution. In vanilla, the absolute maximum that we can transport over a single conveyor belt is 45 items a second. When we're just starting out, this seems like a lot, but there are places in the game where this becomes absolutely critical. Let's take walls as an example. A single wall requires five stone blocks and takes half a second to produce. If we take assembly machine three for our example, I base everything on assembly machine three, then a single assembly machine requires five times 1.25 divided by a half stone blocks a second, which is 12 and a half blocks a second. A single blue belt of stone blocks will only be able to satisfy 3.6 assembly machines before it is completely exhausted. If we consider that 45 blocks a second requires 90 stone per second and 72 furnaces, and all it is able to satisfy is 3.6 assembly machines, then I hope you start to see my point. If we have a block with say 10 assembly machines in it making walls, then we would need three full blue belts of stone block to achieve maximum efficiency. What I'm trying to say is that there is a limit to the general factorial solution of more equals better, and that limit is 45 things per second on a conveyor belt. We probably also need to talk about pipes. The flow rate of a fluid or a gas through a pipe is unknown. Well, there are places you can go on the internet which will tell you what a pipe can achieve given certain conditions, pumps at certain intervals or whatever. But the idea of trying to allow for that in a factory design is practically impossible. We don't know how big our factory might be when we start it. The idea of being able to calculate any distances with accuracy to know what the flow rate might be in advance of actually building a factory, it's completely impossible. Let's just assume we won't ever know what a pipe is capable of achieving. The wall problem I went through earlier is like the other side of the coin I'm about to explain. When we need a lot of material in a particular process, it is really easy to underestimate what the flow rates are required to be. But ultimately, if we fail to provide a set of assembly machines with enough material, then all that will happen is we get less output. The block of assembly machines making walls will essentially swallow up every single stone block we throw at it and it will give out what we put in. But there are also processes which do the opposite. We put in a single piece of something and we get two or more things out. It is incredibly easy to get into a pattern where a single conveyor belt leads up to a process and a single conveyor belt leads away from it, but in processes like this it leads to an incredible loss of efficiency. Take copper cables as an example. We take a single copper plate and we turn it into two copper cables. If we have a single blue conveyor of copper leading into a block of assembly machines and a single conveyor of copper cables leading out, then we have immediately cut our efficiency by half. 45 copper plates gives us 90 copper cables and we therefore need two blue conveyor belts out for every blue conveyor in. If we are only using 45 because we don't have enough conveyor belts, that is a huge loss. And here's the thing, because copper cables are so important in vanilla for computer chips, it is really easy to get this wrong and immediately reduce the number of computer chips you are able to create by half. And this is just in vanilla. In other mods, there are recipes where a single thing will create three things, or four things, or five or more. By miscalculating how much output is going to come from a particular process, it is possible to immediately handicap our factory by much higher factors than two. We could end up in a situation where only 20% of our factory is operating. I put these things in the critical processes category. 
along with copper and iron and steel and computer chips and everything else that I consider to be important in a factory design. Yep, when I am designing vanilla factories, one of my prime concerns is how I'm going to deal with copper cables. I treat them as one of the most important things in a vanilla factory design. And I am convinced that the general intention of the whole game is to hide this problem behind innocuous materials. Copper cables in vanilla are probably not an item many think is all that important. In my current Crestorio run, one of the materials I've given the most attention to is sand. In Angel and Bob, a lot of my problems revolved around sulfur wastewater and geodes and residual gas, which are not primary materials by any stretch of the imagination. But by treating all of these just as seriously as the primary materials, I have found that factors of improvement in the order of three or maybe even four times is possible. Ultimately, what I try and achieve with these big factories in mod sets which are completely impossible to mathematically plan through in detail is to identify these key high volume materials which might be obscured by an innocuous material name so that I can plan around them. I want the key primary processes to be the bottleneck, not any of the fringe ones. This is the point in the video where we need to venture down the rabbit hole of excess products. In vanilla, we don't really have any excess products. Well, we do. When we refine oil, we get three things. And this is kind of analogous to the problem I'm talking about. The difference is that in vanilla, we are able to convert these three things into each other with further factory processes. And so the fact that they are technically excess is less relevant. It becomes an exercise in balancing, not one of ejection. In a lot of mod sets, there are processes where there are excess products, and these need to be managed just as seriously as the primary products, or they will jam up and prevent production of the primary stuff. And really, the primary stuff is the stuff we care about. The excess products need to be ejected from the system immediately, and then dealt with in a way that removes any possibility that they might back up and influence the primary process. If the excess product is a gas or a liquid, then there are generally tools to immediately remove them if that is what we choose to do. So I just want to jump in real quick. Um, what we see here is my hydrogen and chlorine setup for Crestorio 2. And for this setup, we have a situation whereby, because we're producing both these gases from the same process, both hydrogen and chlorine, we could end up in a situation where we are in abundance of one of them, but we are in deficit in another. And we need to be able to come up with a system to flare off the relevant gas to make sure that we can produce the thing that we need at that moment in time. You know, if we have too much hydrogen, then the thing that we probably need is chlorine. So in order to achieve that, I've kind of separated the whole system off. We've got these two storage tanks which measure the balance of the, these relevant gases that are in the system. And then I've got um, a system of circuit networks which detects which one of these things is true. So if we go over to here, we've got, this is the system I think for flaring off chlorine. So if hydrogen is less than 5,000, imagine we've got this storage tank that's got a maximum capacity of 25,000. So this is less than 20% of that tank is full of hydrogen, then B equals one. And then if chlorine is greater than 20,000, so that would be 80% of that tank, then B is also equal to one. And then if both of those conditions are true, then B will equal to two, and we want this pump to activate. And that's how I've kind of set up a system whereby this We've always, I've always guaranteed that I'll always have both hydrogen and chlorine in the system. This, this little circuit network over here, this does the complete opposite. So this will detect when hydrogen is in abundance, but when chlorine is in deficit. And similarly, we've got other processes that do almost the same thing. So we've got over here, we've got hydrogen and oxygen. Uh, yeah. So I just wanted to go through the, the, this process because it's not technically an excess process. You know, neither one of these things are technically excess, but both of them could could potentially be excess at, at one stage in time. So it's more or less the same sort of thing with the oil where we're, we're just trying to balance these two things together. Um, there are other gases where they are just purely excess. We'll get to those in a second. Flares for gases, clarifiers for liquids. This isn't my general preference. In my experience, these excess products turn out to be really useful in their own right if they are given enough attention. And just flaring them off or clarifying them feels like an easy way out. So what you can see in front of you is my oil setup in Angel and Bob. And the part of the screen that you can see particularly is the, the part which deals with residual gas. 
So you might not necessarily be familiar with Angel and Bob. So just to give you a quick breakdown, we have a gas and we have to convert that gas into another gas. And then we have to convert that gas into another gas. And then we have to convert that gas into another gas. And then we can convert it into plastic or resin or something useful along the ways. So there's several stages of conversion that we have to go through before with the original gas that we, we start with before we can use it usefully in the factory. And every step along the way, every one of those conversions, we produce a small amount of this residual gas. And in isolation for each of these processes, it's probably not all that much. But when you add it up for the whole factory, for the whole oil production part of Angel and Bob, it actually turns out to be quite a lot. And it is really, really easy for it to completely overwhelm the system. So when I built this factory, I made it the centerpiece. I made when I say the centerpiece, what I mean is that it's the first thing I lay down. It's the, it's the thing that I consider to be the most important part of this particular factory. So when I, when I built this factory, I made residual gas, which is an excess product and is produced in very, very small amounts that's difficult to notice and add up. I made it the centerpiece of the whole oil setup. And the thing about residual gas in Angel and Bob is that you can turn it into the original gas which starts the whole process. And uh, in that conversion, you produce residual gas. It becomes like this huge circular process. And in building the factory, I had to specifically restrict the amount of gas that was coming in off the trains because this residual gas became so dominant. And it was really difficult. It was something that was completely unexpected. I, well, you know, I did not imagine that residual gas could be so important. And then when I built this factory and made it the centerpiece and realized you know, how much I was producing and how it just dominated the whole oil setup. And that's most of the oil setup, probably two thirds is dedicated to gas. And this residual gas completely neglected, completely took away the purpose of a lot of the gas setup that you use to convert it from the trains, the stuff that you put out the mines. This residual gas just completely replaced it. It was a completely unknown side effect that I did not anticipate. And, and it's one of the reasons why I look at excess products so carefully nowadays because I, can, I know the value of them. I, I know how much greater efficiency can be gained by making it the centerpiece, making it being the, making the excess products the most important thing. And then the primary products just kind of happen as an end result. It's like a, it's a, it's a weird part of Factorio to get your head around, that, to think about these excess products as the most important thing. But that's what I found at the end of Asian and Bob. But equally, these are all factory processes liable to jamming up if the conditions are right. And so flaring and clarifying absolutely needs to be built in. I just use those as a last resort. If the thing being ejected is a thing and not a gas or a liquid, then we need to find a way to process it immediately and then feed it back into the system with some kind of priority flow that removes the potential for backing up. Or we could store it. But if we store it, we are actually only building up a problem for the future. The longer we leave it, the more material we need to store and the bigger problem it will be when we eventually deal with it. The final thing to say is that depending on your playstyle and the mods you are using, you might have completely different problems to the ones I have had. There might be ingredients and processes which you find difficult, but that I haven't because I play the game differently. And you know, vice versa. There might be things that I found difficult that you have just breezed through. That's just part of the way that it goes. I've tried to use specific examples to illustrate my points, but really all I can do is give you the tools to investigate your own factory so that hopefully you can identify the things that matter to it the most.